Good morning. I hope that over the past two weeks, third week this morning, I hope that there's been a weight laid on you concerning how we are to bless the generations to come. It's not, this is not mere opinion. It's not just what will work best. It's not simply a good idea. It's the command of God. We, we've seen scripture after scripture that concerns those that will come later. Our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and for all of us, what will be the church and what will be the state of this church? When you look forward 200 years from now, what do you want for this church to be? Who do you want us to be? How would you like for us to be standing? What effect will we be having on the community during that period? And I think everybody would say, well, I would wish them well and I wish good for them. But don't we know that there are things we can be doing to help to ensure that? There are things that we can do. And, you know, the past two weeks we've looked at two of them. The first one is fight the battles that are on our doorstep right now. You know, I mean, it's, it's a silly idea to think that if there's a spiritual battle, there's a cultural battle that is ideological and philosophical and it's anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-Bible, and it desires to take over the minds of, of the, the polis. Because that exists and because that reality is there, it's not a good idea to think I'll go to sleep and we'll sleep over the bad times, and maybe when we wake up, things will have gotten better. Do you remember that quote from Spurgeon, where he was calling, he was saying, church, let's rise up, let's fight the battles that are on our doorstep, and what did he say? He said, look, you sirs, there are generations yet to come. If the Lord doesn't speedily return, there will be a generation and another generation and what will happen is if we just sleep through these times, if we put our heads in the sand, if we pretend like these, these problems will not affect us and won't affect our children, if we pretend that, they will inherit something for which they will curse our name for not being faithful to the call. So we have to fight. Look, we don't like to fight. The church has been so feminized to think that you should never fight. That's not biblical. Why in Ephesians 6 does he say, take up the sword of the Spirit? Why does he say that? What are we to be doing with that? It's a word of God. And by virtue of it being a sword, it's a weapon. And it is to be used to bring about, to cut away unrighteousness from self and to destroy ideological enemies of God. So we have to fight. But last week we looked at Nehemiah and we noticed that they had a sword in one hand, they had a sword on their hip, and what did they have in the other hand? A trowel. They were building. So, so Nehemiah and, and his men, they saw the problems that were before them. They knew that they would have, they knew there was a great work to be done in building God's kingdom once again. And so they went out and they said, we're going to build this. And they knew they needed manpower, so they got everybody. They said, look, look at the problems that are all around us. Look at the dilapidated buildings. Look at the broken down walls. Look at the former glory of Israel and remember how it used to be and see where we are now. We need to rebuild. And so they got together to build. They weren't just, they had the sword there for the enemies that were surrounding them because there were people that wanted to thwart the work of God. But they, they didn't just, it's not like warring was the only thing that they did. Pointing out the problems and, and talking about, you know, the faults and all the things that are wrong, that's, that's only, that's only to, the only reason for that is to, to stop the enemy from continuing in their false ideas and to help us to see and get a framework of what we need to do going forward. But then we build. And so last week's lesson was build everything excellently. Do you remember from <clears throat> 1 Corinthians, the passage that we were looking at, that where Paul says the, the foundation which was laid is Jesus Christ, and we're building on it. But he said this, 
He said, take care how you build on that foundation. Be careful. Consider. Be, be, be very wise. Be very uh, shrewd in how you build this, this uh, structure, the church, and how you build your community and how you build your family. Because <clears throat> you could build with wood, stone, hay, straw. But he says, there will come a time, the fire is going to come, and it will put to test what you built. And he says, your work could be burned up. Do, do we, as a church, do you want to, can you imagine laboring your whole life and then getting to the end of your life as you're just about to leave and watching all the things that you did be burned up and destroyed? Can you imagine that? Would there be a worse thing? All the time, the energy, the resources, the tears, the sweat, the blood, everything poured into something that's just being destroyed. So he says, you may yourself be saved. But he says, but your work could be destroyed if you did it in a haphazard, shoddy way. And I mean, so, so that incentive that we talked about last week for as we're looking forward to the next generation, we need to build something that they can inherit that's going to be a, a great place of learning, a great place where they can come and be blessed. And part of the incentive is if we don't, then maybe our work will just be burned up. And we don't want to see that, that happen. But the other incentive, do you remember at the end of that passage what Paul said? If your work isn't burned up, he said you yourself will receive a reward for it. Now, this is in addition to salvation because he said if your work is burned up, you yourself will still be saved if you stand the test, if you personally stand the test. The works you built, they may be burned up, but if you stand the test, you yourself will be saved. But he says, but if your works aren't burned up, if your works that you did stand, you will receive a reward. Now, I don't know exactly what that is. And I'm not going to get into all of the evidences for it, but there is evidence that in eternity, there are levels of reward. That's one of the scriptures to show it. The Apostle Paul is going to have a greater reward than I have. How many millions did he save? His work is still changing the world. He, he will have a greater reward. And... I think that we want to work for a greater reward. So we need to fight. We need to build. But this morning's lesson is, is really about the frame of mind that we need to have as we go forward into this. This is where the fruit of the way you think, everything you do in this life, everything you go forward and do will be a product of the way you think. So just generally, if your thinking is bad, if your thinking is corrupted, if, if, your, if your mind has been corrupted and, and it's been poisoned and maybe it's, or, or maybe you think it's, it's righteous, maybe you think it's Christian, but it actually isn't, what will your works produce? You, you can't produce anything good if your mind isn't, if your mind hasn't been transformed to be like that of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I want to talk about what our, what our thinking should be informed by. Um, so I'm going to talk about hindsight, insight, and foresight. These three areas that should be informing the way that we think and, and that will inform our behaviors and our actions right now. So something about looking behind us and seeing what has come before what people did and what they didn't do, and what were, what were the results of those things, that's hindsight. And then insight, this idea of what's happening right now in my community, among my people, in my church family, in my personal family, in the, you know, on the national level. Having insight that, that goes beyond being aware of a current event. Biblical insight is more than just an awareness of a date and a time and a place and an event. But it, but it understands, here's what's really happening. So that's insight. And then foresight is being able to anticipate based on what you're seeing 
and based on what the scriptures say, and based on the shrewdness and the wisdom that comes by the Spirit of God, here's what's going to be coming, and how can I posture myself? What should we be doing right now to prepare and make ourselves in a good position for when whatever is coming, when it lands on our, on our shores? So that's what the lesson is going to be about. And I want to start you off, get, I want to give you a, an idea, an illustration to help you realize how important information and knowledge and what goes into your head really is. As I was developing the lesson this week, I was thinking about, you know, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting if you go through history, there are a lot of instances where there were like massive book burnings. And you've heard of these. And, you know, some of, I, I've seen some of these depicted in film and, you know, I've seen old pictures of them and, you know, maybe even heard something of it back when I was in high school. But, you know, I did a little bit of light research. What, what was the deal with those? And it, it's the kind of things you'd think. You know, why would you burn a bunch of books? Well, one of the chief ones is whoever was the power, whoever was the authority, saw the ideas in those books, whatever that literature was, as being, you know, something that was a threat to what they were trying to do with the people. So if I can destroy that book, if we can burn all these books and just get rid of them, then these ideas can no longer inform the mindset of the people. It's the same idea behind why there would be people that tried so hard to destroy the Bible. They didn't want Christ to succeed. They didn't want him to conquer. They didn't want minds that would, you know, come to a knowledge and awareness of Christ. So that was one of the reasons. One of the reasons was maybe there was some historical event that was incriminating of the people. And if the people got their hands on it, they would see, you know, whoever's in authority right now shouldn't actually be in authority. Um, it's really easy to change information. You don't even need to burn books now because you can just change websites and you can change information that's present and you can just delete and, you know, delete thousands of emails and there's a little, and then it's gone. We've got politicians that do that kind of stuff. Oh, it didn't happen. I just deleted those thousands of emails by accident right before the information was about to be incriminating of me, right? So we see this information having a, a broad understanding of what's happened is so profoundly important. So when I was researching this, I came across a speech by a Nazi leader named Joseph Goebbels. And he had something to do with the, the war economy in Germany. He was one of the chief um, people that Hitler had in charge of that, in charge of developing an economy that was built and geared for war. Joseph Goebbels, so the, the Battle of Stalingrad had, had ended which was a really, uh, really important location. The Soviets had won. Germany was now kind of behind. It really tipped the scale in favor of the Soviets after the Battle of Stalingrad had been completed. And so Joseph Goebbels went and he, he gathered together this massive audience of Nazi fanatics that was there. And he delivered a ridiculously long speech. I did not read all of it, but I, but I read pieces of it after a, another piece of information had led me to this speech. And I want you to hear what Joseph Goebbels said. So he's trying to get, everybody knows the severity of the war right now. This is 1943, and they know we could lose this war now. All this, all this effort started in 39, I think. All of this effort for these past years of fighting could be for naught if we don't get everybody on board and make the most out of what we're doing here. So Joseph Goebbels gave this message, and I want to give you a couple snippets from it. And I hope you'll see the point. He said, the National Socialist government has both the moral and political duty to oppose such attempts, if necessary, with draconian penalties. He's, now, you'll see the context of what he means. Um, uh, he's, he's talking about people that are, that are not fully on board with the war. They're just using their time idly. They're just going about living their lives like you'd like to live. And so he's saying, we're going to oppose that, if necessary, with draconian penalties. You probably heard the term draconian over the past couple of years. There are therefore a series of measures that take account of the war's optics. We have ordered, for example, the closing of bars and nightclubs. I can't imagine that people who are doing their duty for the war effort still have energy to stay out late into the night in such places. 
We've also closed luxury restaurants that demand far more resources than is reasonable. It may be that an occasional person thinks that even during war his stomach is the most important thing. We can't pay him any heed. Countless luxury stores have also been closed. They often offended the buying public. There was generally nothing to buy, um, unless perhaps one paid here and there with butter or eggs instead of money. What good do shops do that no longer have anything to sell but only use electricity, heating, and human labor that's lacking everywhere else, particularly in the armaments industry? It is, for example, intolerable that certain men and women stay for weeks in spas and trade rumors taking places from soldiers on leave or from workers who are entitled to a vacation after a year of hard work. On the other hand, and, and I'm cutting out pieces along the way. I want you to see, close this, close this, close this, close this. Keep people from gathering in these places. On the other hand, and, and here's, here's the key. Please understand this. On the other hand, the government is doing all it can to give the people the relaxation they need in these trying times. Theaters, movie houses, and music halls remain in full operation. The radio is working to expand and improve its programming. We have no intention of inflicting a gray winter mood on our people. That which serves the people and keeps up its fighting and working strength is good and essential to the war effort. Close down, why would you have a people that want to close down everywhere where people gather to converse? And keep all the places open where there's no conversation, but you're being passively fed information by somebody else. You just sit there, be receiving of information. Receive the movie, which the, the films at the time were full of propaganda. You're talking about ramping up the, the radio so that people can get the propaganda. There are wicked forces that, that are demonic and that are from Satan himself. And what they do is they get into Disney Channel. And they get into CNN and Fox News and all of these media outlets. And what they do is they cast these messages and we sit there and we listen to them and we receive them. Why would the Nazis stand again by closing all of the doors where people speak and leaving open all the places where people merely receive information? It was so that they could control the narrative, keep conversation from happening that would thwart and shut down maybe the bad policies and ideas that were spreading and open people's minds by, by repetition to bad ideas. This same thing happens today. I wonder where we get most of the ideas that we esteem as valuable. We might have gotten them from a parent. We might have gotten them from a community. They might have been given in our education. We might have received it from a movie. We might have heard it in a song. We might have read a philosopher if we're into that kind of thing. Maybe we read it in a devotional that claims to be about the Bible. Jeremiah said, My people, this is God speaking through Jeremiah, My people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. But how to do good they know not. The people of God dwelling in the city of God with the word of God and the priests of God and all the covenants of God and the promises of God and all the information about God and what had they filled themselves with not the things of God and so therefore they were wise in doing evil they had no idea how to do good and God said they are stupid children literally does say that God said that not me our enemy our, our great enemy does the vast majority of his warfare in the realm of information, where he shapes our thoughts, where he subtly changes meanings of words, where he rewrites history, and where he clouds the words of God with cultural virtues that are close enough that they look like they're the same thing, but subtly they really are not at all. I mean, that, that's happening. I mean, and so this idea is, how can we put ourselves in a good, healthy position as a church within the leadership and with those, you know, within those that are giving information to the church and for the church to be in this position where we've got the strongest standing for 
where we are right now and where we, we're going to put ourselves in a great position for the church that's to come. And the idea is we need to have a godly hindsight. We need to have a godly insight that comes from the wisdom of the Lord. Like, like the Lord says, you know, pray to me, ask me for wisdom and I'll give it. Ask for wisdom and I'll give it. Wisdom concerns how to take information that you knew about right and wrong and how to take information about what's happening today and put them together so you know your path forward. God says, you ask me, I'll give it. Beg me for wisdom. I heard a man many years ago and it changed my life. He, I said, well, how did you get so wise? He said, I beg the Lord every single day for wisdom. I go into the presence every day. I say, give me more wisdom. Give me more wisdom because God promises I'll do it. So we have to understand what happened in a godly way. We have to understand what's happening through the wisdom of God. And we have to know what's coming down the pipe and posture ourselves in a good way so that we're ready for that. That's how we're going to be a blessing to the generations to come. So this morning, let's look at a godly hindsight. What's the main reason why a political leader would burn books, destroy books, incite the people to just destroy them. Well, we talked about that, right? You, you, you're not going to be informed and you're probably not going to make the best decisions if you have no idea what happened before you. How do we bless the coming generations? We know our history and we teach our children history. And we teach them biblical history from the Bible, and we teach them world history from a theological perspective that's informed by the Bible, so that you can look at the rise and fall of Rome and say, here's what's, what happened. Here's why the Romans conquered and why eventually they were conquered. is because they got arrogant and they allowed rampant immorality to, to enter every single office in the Roman Empire. So they were not united and they fell and what can we learn about that spiritually we got to learn about the egyptians and the persians and the assyrians and the babylonians and the medes and the greeks and what happened with all these people that stuff should be being taught we need to know what happened before and i think that we need to be informing the way that schools are teaching kids history i remember when i was in history class let me break it down for you it was a high school football coach in almost every one of them who was required to teach a class, he chose history as the class, and he made us memorize a bunch of dates that I will never remember, and a bunch of information that never had application. That's not teaching history. We need to know what happened before us. Romans 15 and verse 4 says this, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. It was written for our instruction. We're to be able, we should be able to look back and say, that happened to those people because they did this. Therefore, today, I'm not going to do this because I know what happened to them when they did. That's what it's about. Know your history. Know what happened before. Second Timothy chapter 3, Paul told Timothy, he says, you're acquainted. You're well acquainted with the scriptures that you've known from your youth that are able to make one wise unto salvation. And he's talking about this historical books. He's talking about Genesis through Deuteronomy and the prophets and the judges and the chronicles and the kings and all those stories that inform us on what we're to be doing. Now, don't just think that knowing history and knowing a biblical history and having a biblical worldview in this regard is just a good idea. It's actually a command of God that we know it ourselves and that we be teaching it to our children and to our grandchildren. I want to show you a scripture because... Look, being a Christian and being faithful to the task is more than just showing up at church and being a generally good person and following a few points of doctrine for two hours once a week. Being a Christian is all-encompassing, and it's, it's massively important. One of the hugest things is what concerns those who are going to come later. So let me read this to you. If you want to join me there, this is Psalm 78, but listen to this because... This, is, this weighs heavily on me as a father, and, and it should weigh heavily on other fathers, and it should weigh heavily on grandfathers, because he's speaking to you and to me. Listen to what he says. God, second, this is Psalm 78, 
verse 5, it says, God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law. And that's, so Genesis to Deuteronomy is a testimony and a law. That's what he's talking about. He, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers. He commanded our fathers to teach their children. He commanded our fathers to teach their children. He didn't command youth ministers to teach the youth group. He didn't command parents to bring their kids to church so the preacher can tell them or the Bible class instructor could tell, could tell them. He looked at every father and he said, you teach these things to your kids. Talk to them about these things so that the next generation might know them. Oh, to uh, the children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children. So you tell your kids who will tell their kids who will tell the kids who aren't even on the face of the earth yet. He's thinking forward and he's saying, teach it, teach it, teach it so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Notice this is forward looking and it's backwards looking. So they, they, they should set their hope in God looking forward to what's to come because of the promises of God and not forget the, the works of God, which is going to keep them on that straight path, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. So God is saying, this is a command. I command you, dads, teach your kids. Teach your kids. Talk to them of these things often and look back. Keep looking back at what happened. Keep looking back at these things so that we wouldn't be like their fathers. Now, this is the principle of doctrinal hindsight. And the fact is that having a godly understanding of the things that have happened before us helps us to not make the same mistakes. It helps us to avoid the pitfalls of those that came before us. There's no wiser pursuit than to study biblical history. So he's commanding us to do this. And so this morning, the word of the Lord, and I'm, I'm just reading it, the word of the Lord is commanding fathers in here. It doesn't matter how old your kids are. Teach them these things. And it's commanding uh, grandfathers to do the same. So listen to what he goes on to say. This is verse 9. The Ephraimites, and because because look, I, I just I don't understand why saying things like why why churches don't spend more time saying these things that concern the eternal souls of our progeny. Because we would say I love them, we would say I want what's best for them, we would say I want what's good for them, but we live in ways that shows that we're not. Really and truly. And, and I understand it, it's, it's, it's better to hear, or so we think. I, I was listening to a guy the other name named Joel Beakey. And he's written a lot about the, um, the Puritans. And kind of the way that they thought about things. And he was talking about his dad, who put him on his knee. And his dad would say, What's better? What's better? A, a, piece of, uh, a piece of good news or a wisdom or instruction? Which of these is, is better? And he just said, well, Dad, I don't know. And his dad said, wisdom and instruction. Because a piece of good news may change your moment, but wisdom and instruction is going to guide you in everything that you do going forward. The majority of preaching that's going to be valuable for us is going to be instructive. It's going to tell us about things that we need to hear because here's, here's history. Here's what the psalmist says. He says, here's why you teach it. You want to know the weight? You want to know the reason? You want to know why this is so important? He says, because Eph, the Ephraimites, this is the people from Ephraim, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he'd shown them. They did not know their history. In the sight of their fathers, 
He performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters to stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. So God, God made rocks to open up, just a rock on the ground and water poured out of it. It's, it's amazing what God did. God showed them this. They saw these things, but they forgot them. It says, yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, so listen, they're complaining. That God had just brought them through dry ground in the middle of a sea, delivering them from the Egyptians behind them, bringing to them to the promised land in front of them. He delivered them and gave them safe passage. They're walking through the wilderness and they're thirsty. God strikes open a rock, they get water, and still they don't believe. Still they'd forgotten what those things before them implied. And so God, when they're complaining about bread and meat, it says the Lord heard he was full of wrath. And a fire was kindled against Jacob, and his anger rose against Israel because they didn't believe in God and did not trust his saving power. But here's the thing. The psalm goes on to say that the Lord, in great patience and forbearance, did provide them bread, and he did provide them meat, and he gave them those things they asked for, but then they forgot those things, and they rebelled again. And so it says, in spite of all of this, in spite of all these things, verse 32, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror. Church, look at those precious little ones. Look at these souls that are eternal. Look, think of your children. Think of your grandchildren and what, what matters think I, I that gives me chills it brings tears to my eyes to to think of it of my sons or daughter he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror this is what happened because the lord showed his way and they didn't remember it remember why did they keep disobeying because they kept forgetting they kept forgetting what God had done. They stopped looking back. This is a passage that's saying grandfathers, and I know there's a lot of you in here. It is not too late to do this. It isn't. Take those little grands, put them on your knee. And this passage is actually saying, rather than talking to them about their sporting competition or their dance recital, or how they're doing in school, or something that's going to be ultimately meaningless. He says, put them on your knee and say, let me tell you a story about our great God who delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. Let's talk about his great power. That's what he's saying. Grandfathers, do that. Put them on your knee and tell them a story of history and say, look at what happened to them when they forgot these things. And look him in the eyes and say, don't you ever forget your great God. A godly hindsight is so profoundly important. Godly insight, what's happening right now, is also. Let me read you this word that is, it blows my mind. This is from 1 Chronicles chapter 12. I'm just going to give you pieces along the way, but... David's mighty men, one of my favorite things in the Bible, is mighty men. I was telling Judah the other day about these, these men that came maybe from Benjamin, and it said that their faces were like that of a lion. And um, they, uh, we'll read this in just a second. It says, these are the men who came to David at Ziklag. Well, he could not move about freely because of Saul, the son of Kish, and they were the mighty men who helped him in war. They were bowmen and could shoot arrows and sling stones with either the right or left hand. 
They were Benjamites, Saul's kinsmen. Read these stories to your boys. These are awesome, man-forming, masculine, testosterone-producing stories. <laughs> Read them to your boys. They need to hear these stories. From the Gadites, there went over to David at the stronghold in the wilderness. This is one of my favorite things. Mighty and experienced warriors, experts with shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions and who were swift as gazelles upon the mountains. The Gadites were officers of the army. The least was a match for a hundred men, the greatest for a thousand. One man against a thousand. So this is the original SEAL Team 6 you know what that is. But these, these guys were awesome, equipped warriors who were experts in their craft. And you see that all these great men are crowding around David, men that were willing to fight, men that were courageous to fight, men that understood the reason for the fight, men that were equipped and had the skill set to be able to effectively fight. Thousands of them gathering around David saying, you're going to be king. We've got your back. Let's go forward and let's, let's build the kingdom and let's do this together. But notice this. It wasn't just skilled men. Because one of the most amazing things is down in verse 32, it says of Issachar, men, these men, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. 200 chiefs and all their kinsmen under their command. So you got mighty men, skilled men, valiant men, courageous men, men willing to fight for the cause that they knew was a good cause. And the Lord did not just keep them in that. The Lord bestowed upon them 200 chiefs of Issachar, who it says had an understanding of the times so that they might direct Israel what they should do. You may have all of the power, you may have all of the force in the world, all the manpower, all the skill sets. But if there's not godly wisdom at the top that's directing and giving insight to what's going on, it's going to be a fruitless effort. We need to know what's going on. Karl Barth said, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret the newspapers through the Bible. And what I see today is that there's many that have both, they're reading the newspaper, doing nothing with the Bible, or they're reading the newspaper and letting it be the thing that informs the Bible. Socially, you're seeing this happen right now before our eyes on what's playing out. Social media regarding abortion, regarding homosexuality, regarding the radical gender ideology, regarding all of these things. You're seeing this happen. So you must know both. You must know what's happening, and you must inform current events through what the Scripture says. So let me give you one little piece of insight. We must have a godly insight. Let me just give you one that, that I think we need to be very keenly aware of. So please, please hear this. And I want to, I, I wrote this, but I want to read it so that I say it exactly the way I want to say it. The, the devil has captivated psychology. Pick up any Psych psychology, self-help self -help book, any of it. It's anti-gospel. The devil's captivated psychology, philosophy, education, human sexuality, science, and many parts of government. Now, here's what's borne out because of this. Psychologists have pushed self-love and the authentic self. Just be whoever you are right now and love that. And, and you remember in high school when somebody would write in your yearbook, don't ever change? Do you remember that? Man, I got, I got some of those written and, and I think, man, I'm nothing the same and I'm so glad that I'm not. I, there's, we should change. So I, my authentic self at 17 needed to change a whole lot. But they pushed self-love and the authentic self. Philosophers take that idea, self-love, authentic self. But you take self-love and authentic self out into a world where there's objective truth, you're going to very quickly realize, 
I shouldn't be loving some of the things that I'm doing in my authentic self, and maybe I should change. So what happened in the world of philosophy was the philosophers, devil has them too, the philosophers pushed a subjective, personal kind of truth. The kind of truth that says my experience and who I am cannot be questioned by you. Now this is postmodernism. If you pay attention to philosophical history, what's happened, postmodernism is after all of the optimism of modernity, where we had the Industrial Revolution and we did so much good, people realized there's still so many questions that aren't answered and there's still so much disagreement amongst the experts. Therefore, we can never know, we will never know. My truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. Subjective, personal truth. That's postmodernism. So you have an authentic self-love for who you are. You go out into a world that says you can be whatever you want because there is no objective truth. Now, we're the church, and we're looking at these things, and we're thinking, boy, we got to do something about this. We've we got a standard right here. we got the Bible, and it's saying that what you're doing is wrong, and you need to change that. And we love you, and we want, your, we want you to repent from those dead works so that you can go be saved for all eternity. But guess what? The devil also got into the church. And you know the message that he gave to the church? The message that he gave to the church is he, he took, what he did was he took the idea and the concept of love. And he kept all of the wonderful connotations like God is love, Jesus is love, love is what makes the world go round. He took all of these wonderful ideas and the connotations from love, but he redefined the base of what love was. So people carried forward these good feelings, but they changed the definition of love. And now the definition of love is that love does not offend. Love never hurts somebody's feelings. And so we're the church, and we're told to love God. We're told to love man. This means I will never offend, and I will never hurt their feelings. So you may have a Bible that says they're wrong what they're doing, but if I love them, I won't hurt their feelings, so I'll be quiet. And the devil came along, and he cut off the church's mouth. Let me, let me read to you what Jesus said. Did y'all see this? Y'all see this? This is, this is what's going on. So Jesus was in public. And Jesus, what's his pursuit on earth? Save man. Save man. Bring salvation. Complete the mission of God. Finish this redemptive scheme of God that had been set from eternity past. And Jesus told some opposers of his, you hypocrites. He said this to them in public. Winsome? You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And they left from there, and then the disciples came and said to Jesus, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? What do you think Jesus said? Oh, I better take it back. Because love is not offensive. No. Do you know they were offended? Jesus said, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. He didn't care that they were offended. And Jesus is the embodiment of love. Love shares the truth. It speaks the truth. It does not do so to offend, but it does so knowing that it will offend because the people that it does offend, whose hearts are repentant, will hear the word and will say, I must change and salvation will come to them. But if we be quiet because we buy an idea of love that isn't biblical, then we've failed. This is insight of what's happening now, and we must have it going forward to be a blessing. Now, lastly and quickly, a godly foresight. What's coming down the pipe? Now, you, we could take a survey. We could all fill out our little answers. What do you think your children's children, what do you think the world will be like for them? If you're just anticipating based on what you see, do you see good? Do you see it being better than it is right now? If you see it being bad, what should you do right now to say, I'll combat that. 
I don't will that or wish that. I'll do now what I must do for them, knowing what I believe they'll face based on what I'm seeing right now. I think that's what we should do. And a godly foresight goes like this. Proverbs 30, 24 says, The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says the same thing. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Why does the ant do this? Why does it gather in stockpile? Because it knows winter is coming. It knows. Winter's coming. I won't be able to gather. I know it's going to be cold. I know there won't be food. So I'll do this right now so that when that cold, harsh time comes, we're protected here. That's a good principle for the church. Joseph did the same thing. The Lord came to him and helped him to understand a dream that Pharaoh had where there'd be seven years of plenty and rain and a huge harvest, and then there'd be seven years of famine. Seven years where there'd be nothing, no rain, only hot sun baking down, and there'd be nothing to eat. Nothing would happen. And so the Lord gave wisdom to Joseph to say what he ought to do with those seven good and plentiful years. Get ready. Do what you must right now to prepare for what's coming. Isn't that a godly principle? So here's what's coming down the pipe, or some ideas to help frame it. Number one, we know the Lord Jesus is coming. It's general, but that's actually one of the most important things to keep before us, is to know the Lord Jesus is coming, and to ask, how is he going to find us? What will he see with us as a church? And you remember that story, the parable that Jesus gave just before he was about to leave this earth about the person that was given you know, five talents, three talents, and one talent. And those people took those resources and those abilities and the things God had given them, and the ones that were praised were the ones that put those things to work so that when the master came back, he would find them making a profit with what he'd given them. But there was the one person who knew that there were going to be hard times ahead. He knew that Jesus was going to be um, retributive in his justice. And so they said, oh, well, I took what I had and I buried it in the, in the sand and I did nothing with it, but I still have it. You can have it back. How were they found by the Lord? Did he say they were faithful because they still had the one thing they were left with? They weren't faithful, were they? Jesus said, go away from me, you wicked servant. Whether you have one talent, three talents, or five talents, let's use them. Let's, let's stockpile them. There's a lot of good brains in here, a lot of good hearts in here, a lot of good knowledge, a lot of good wisdom, so many different abilities in here. How can we collaborate it and bring it together for the greatest good so that we're found faithful by the Lord to say we had this many talents and we went and we did this with it? Know that there will be hard times. We can see it coming. The scriptures speak of it. And history repeats it. Know that if Jesus doesn't speedily return, there will be another generation. This is looking down the pipe. Another generation's coming. So we know these things. Look at the perimeter of our nation, the problems that's being faced on the perimeter, and, and use your wisdom to say, how long will it be before those things encroach and come here? Look at trends. What trends have happened in your lifetime? What things have you seen happen? Are we better in certain trends than we were 50 years ago? Fathers, anticipate what fruit your family lifestyle will have on your kids' eternity. Again, I was listening to Joel Beakey. He wrote about the Puritans, and one of the things that the Puritans was, now you can have your, you know, we'd have our, we'd take issue with some of the things about them, but there's a lot of good that we can say about them as well. They, they transformed the world. They were really and truly a very proactive and upright people who did a ton of good. And you know what was central to them? What they believed was the most important thing, having family worship every single day. Family worship. They believed that in your homes, you should be having family worship every day. Because the idea is, 
your kids, if they don't see God brought into everyday life, they'll think that all God is is this little you know, thing over here on the perimeter. And so they sang together, they prayed together, they studied the scriptures together every single day. And I, and I want to call the church to do the same thing. The scriptures call us to it a lot. But look forward and say, fathers, is what I'm doing right now going to make my kids faithful in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years after I'm gone so that I can look on them in my deathbed and say, I'm innocent of your, of your blood. I shared with you. I brought you before Jesus every day. This is what we're called to do, and it's a beautiful thing. And, and we can learn from past mistakes. And we, and, and we can start now, and we can go forward and build a kingdom. Yes, that, was, that was a long sermon. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> we got to have a godly, I, you know, I love this church. I love you guys. We're, we're all in. We believe in this place. We believe in this church. And I know I do a lot of instructive type stuff. But I cannot say enough good about you all. I can't say enough good. Everywhere we go, people ask about this church and this family and these people. I've never met a more loving, Christ-centered, outward-focused group. When somebody's hurting, y'all get on it. I mean, I'm learning lessons all the time. And to be honest, that's an area where I really need to improve. I can get my mind into books and do a lot of reading and know about what's going on. But I'm learning from you guys about how to be a servant in the everyday stuff that just has to do with life. There's so much good, and we can do so much more. So let's look back, let's look in, and let's look forward by the help of the Lord, and let's prepare for the next generation to come. Let's stand and sing. Yes, sir.